Uh, so we have a great panel here today. Uh, we're going to touch on some of the next generation topics that are going to impact your buying decisions, uh, especially when it comes to cameras and to imaging devices. Um, I want to start off in, in this, yep, okay, you're on there, sorry. I'm all confused today. So our first, we're going to begin with a 10 minute presentation, roughly, from Tim Ramashko, who is AUVSI, which is Aerial Association, Association. Unmanned, Unmanned Systems International. The, so he is an expert on this stuff, and he will tell you all the things you can't do with drones. Um, and you can probably go, you know, I can say 15 minutes, so we can go, we can stretch a little bit. So please welcome Tim, and then uh, Karen, cue up the slides. Good afternoon. So everybody is interested in what we can do with drones. And the first thing I'm going to tell you is I hate that word, drones, because it implies that they're stupid, and they are not. The, the uh, uh, next slide, please. Where we're going with technology uh, to do what you folks are trying to do with aerial photography is not a technology problem. Uh, I was out walking around in the, uh, in the exhibit hall next door just a couple minutes ago, saw some really neat cameras. How to get those in the air would be pretty cool, pretty big aircraft for some of those, but I did see some cameras that are under a pound and so definitely doable. You'll notice from the slide, a number of, of professional and, and college teams are using unmanned systems to uh, record and, and uh, tape practices. And that's great, but the whole thing with the FAA, the FAA gets a bad rap because the FAA tells everybody, no, you can't use unmanned systems. Uh, so the, the terms that we try to use, first of all, let me back up, unmanned systems, unmanned aerial vehicle, or a UAV, uh, or the, the new term that the FAA has gone to is unmanned aircraft systems, or a UAS. And that, that really speaks to the aircraft, the payload, the data link, which communicates that data back to the ground station, and the ground station or the control station itself where the, where the operator actually functions and can see what's going on. Uh, a lot of people have used uh, um, hobby aircraft. Uh, the DJI Phantom is a very popular aircraft. Uh, put a little camera like a GoPro on it and just send it out and see what you can get. And for hobby stuff, that's fine. A couple thousand bucks and you're great. For what you guys are trying to do, that's just not going to work. You need a much better camera, you need to be able to see what you're doing and uh, be able to, to get any kind of useful information. So professional teams are using it. The, the key though is that that is a closed environment. You don't let a lot of other people on the field in the area where you're, wor where you're working. Um, the movie industry has done the same thing. The movie industry actually has gotten a lot of um, uh, permission or exemptions from the FAA to do movies and commercials and that sort of thing in the last year or so. Uh, but that's because they control that ground or that space where that is being, t where it's being done. The problem that you folks have is that you get a stadium with a whole bunch of people in it and you can't control those people. Those are not willing participants. They are willing spectators, but they're not participants. So that's where we start running into problems with professional and with uh, college events. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the, air, the FAA controls all navigable airspace. It's called the National Airspace System. If we wanted to fly an unmanned system in this room, the FAA would not care. If we get hurt, well, that's too bad, but it's not, we can't, we can't interfere with a manned aircraft. So inside, not a problem. When we, as soon as we get outside, like an outdoor stadium, that's where the FAA comes into effect. It became, it started to become such a problem over major sporting events that the FAA, as of uh, fall of last year, implemented a NOTAM, or a notice to airmen, over all college and professional sporting events. Whether it's a NASCAR event, whether it's a professional football, baseball, or college events, if it's outside, it has a three mile circle that's 3,000 feet high protecting that area. That is a no-fly zone. And if you want to get into a lot of trouble, just go ahead and fly in there the FAA will come down on you with both feet. They, they do have a lot of enforcement ability. And that's whether it's accidental or you're towing a banner or you're just sending up your little quadcopter because you thought it would be fun to pull it out of the trunk of your car and fly over the stadium. Big problems because of all the people that are in there and they're really worried about safety. So they get to be the bad guys. Um, FAA approval is required for all this kind of stuff. Uh, next slide, please. So what I just said, before and after the sporting event, uh, stadium capacities, 30,000 is what we're hearing, but I think that's still, it, that number actually may be high. I think the number is actually lower than that. Any place there's a crowd, the FAA is worried about safety 
and you can't just go flying in there, whether it's a manned aircraft or an unmanned system. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, a lot of things, a lot of people have pushed back on the FAA. There are actually legal ways to do this, and it's called a 333 exemption. If you're a government agency or a government uh, school like Georgia Tech or, or somebody like that, you can actually get a COA, a CLA, Certificate of Authorization, and you can legally fly. You still can't fly over people, but you can fly. If you want to do research, typically universities are doing research. You have students in PhD programs or, or something like that, and you can get uh, authorization to fly. Uh, the 333 exemption, it sounds kind of funny, but 333 is the, is the section of FAA rules or the code that says you cannot do these things. And so to get an exemption from those rules means you can now fly. Um, they give you a laundry list. If you get the exemption, you get a laundry list of things you cannot do. You can't fly at night. You can't fly out of line of sight. You have to have eyes on the aircraft at all times. You can't fly over people. You can't do you know, a number of things. And, and you have to give them a full safety plan, operational considerations of how you're going to be uh, safe in the operation that you're doing. So again, based on what you folks are doing, it's really hard to do that when you're flying over a whole bunch of people. Practices probably can do that. Uh, yeah, warning letters, uh, as it says here, warning letters have gone out and um, actually fines. The FAA recently raised the fines from $10,000 per infraction to $25,000 per infraction. One flight can be multiple infractions, so you can wind up with a whole bunch of problems. Uh, next slide. So dealing with the issues, uh, there are some schools that are, that are, you know, I'm not going to read the quotes, but uh, folks in the industry that are, are, are trying to make this happen. Um, the restricted zones and the, the uh, notice to airmen or the, the uh, TFR as it's called, temporary flight restrictions over the stadiums is, is not just the only thing you have to worry about. You also have other restricted airspace. Within airports, the FAA doesn't want you flying unmanned systems within three miles of airports because you have aircraft going in and out and they're afraid that we're going to conflict. Um, last, uh, last summer, we actually conducted a uh, there's an agricultural expo down in Moultrie, Georgia. It's the second largest agricultural expo in the, in the country, and we successfully flew in by unmanned aircraft right next to manned aircraft taking off and landing for people coming into the show. It's 100,000 people over three days, so it's a, it's a pretty good-sized agricultural show. That one example is being used all over the country now saying, see, we can fly unmanned aircraft right next to manned aircraft, and so we're, we're, we're gaining credibility as we do things safely. So again, the FAA is all after safety and trying to make sure no one gets hurt uh, in an aircraft or on the ground. Uh, next slide. We're almost done. Um, universities and interested, interested can, can get a, a, a COA, the Certificate of Authorization. Uh, but again, that's not really an ongoing operational kind of thing. That's what the 333 is for. It's for commercial operations. And the FAA is just now starting to release um, more and more of those 333 exemptions. They're really careful at first, and they're starting to open that up. So what that means is to get a 333 exemption, you have to have an aircraft that is approved and certified by the FAA as airworthy, which means you can't build it yourself. So a lot of people go on the internet, they, they find a bunch of parts, they put one together, and they think, great, I'm all set to go. Well, that doesn't work because you don't have an exemption for that aircraft. So the aircraft has to be, have an exemption, and you as the operation have to have an exemption, which means you have to have a trained pilot, and you have to have an approved safety procedure, and you have to tell the FAA what you're going to do. You can't just go do anything you, you want to do. Uh, and then you're going to get that laundry list of, of uh, things you can't do from the FAA, like fly over people. Uh, so it really narrows the, the field of who can legally do this, because you're talking some serious money to buy one of these things. Uh, the UAS, the um, unmanned aircraft system with the aircraft, the payload, the data link, and the ground station all being considered as a system gets a little bit pricey. The good news is that you don't really fly the aircraft. You tell it where you want it to go and it flies, it flies there. Usually they're map based so you can put waypoints on a map, you're flying it with an iPad or you're flying it with a computer or the ground station has a built-in computer and you just tell it where to go, how high, how fast, and it goes and does it. So for agricultural applications, that works great because you can just do rows up and down the fields, and that works great. You get very good precision. Um, for what you guys are trying to do, it would be a little different. You can still manually control them, but the aircraft still maintains altitude and heading for you. So it's pretty simple. 
Unfortunately, under the current FAA rules, you need to be a licensed pilot of a real aircraft, helicopter, aircraft, airplane, whichever. So to do this legally, you need to be a pilot, which everybody says, but those are two completely different skill sets. And you'd be right. They are two completely different skill sets. But the FAA wants you to understand airspace, where you can fly, where you can't fly, understanding what the person in the air, real aircraft, the manned aircraft, is thinking when they're flying, so you try to stay out of their way, because they're not going to see you until right before impact. Um, so that's the, that's the current thinking, because the FAA looks at everything from the lens of a pilot. The good news is that they've come out with a proposed of rulemaking, uh, new, new rules that are supposed to take effect in 2016 or 2017, and it opens up the small UAS market a lot. Small meaning under 55 pounds, which would be a lot of the things you guys would want to fly around stadiums. You still can't fly over people, but you don't have to be a pilot anymore. Now you can just be a trained uh, operator of the, of the aircraft. You'll have to take a test, something similar to a driver's license test. You'll have to do a practical exam. You'll have to have recurring training, just like pilots do every couple of years. But you can do it without the expense of a pilot's license. The FAA has kind of heard that and figured that out. If you want to be bigger than 55 pounds, which there are lots of those systems out there, they get very expensive, and then you're going to have to jump through all the hoops we used to have to jump through. And for right now, commercial operations in the continental, in the United States, um, is really difficult with something bigger than 55 pounds. The FAA is not quite there. So you're going to get the 55 pound restriction first, and then, and then after that, hopefully open it up. Um, uh, next slide, please. So there are, some, there are some legitimate uses of, of, uh, of unmanned systems. Obviously, sailing is a great way to do that. Uh, next slide, and then we'll I'll leave it on this next one here. If you go to the next slide, this is the last slide, and it's got some, some stuff. If you're interested in this, there are some, some resources you can go to. Go to the FAA website, and it kind of tells you what the rules are. If you just type in some of the, um, that's a long link, but if you type in COA, COA for, uh, uh, if you're a government-funded school, uh, if you're not, you're going to be under a 333 exemption, which means just commercial operations. So um, I don't know if you want to. I hate to be such a downer and tell you that you can't do it, but legally, we, we, at this point, we just can't do it. Hopefully, as the, as the FAA gains confidence and that we can do things safely, we will uh, get the rules lessened and, and let us do a little bit more. Any questions for Tim? Yes. What about enforcement? How, how good is the FAA in terms of enforcement? If somebody's already doing drones, what's the enforcement and can they keep doing it illegally because there's not enough people? Uh, a lot of people have figured out that the FAA does not have a good enforcement arm. Uh, you can do anything until you get caught. Right, it's just like uh, you know deductions on your taxes. You can deduct anything until they catch you. Um, the FAA recently came out with uh, a directive to local law enforcement saying we are going to extend our authority to enforce this, our our rules to you guys. And most of the cops I talk to say eh, I'm not bothering with that unless they crash into somebody or hurt something, and I have to write a report. I'm not I'm not chasing aircraft. Um, the FAA does get lots of reports of, of unmanned systems in collision course with commercial airliners. Um, last time I heard uh, the, the FAA administrator that's in charge of the UAS <coughs> program for the whole country is here in Atlanta. A great guy, former airline pilot, former Air Force, great guy. He's telling us that he gets um, about 10 or 12 complaints a week. All right, so at first we started seeing aircraft, unmanned aircraft at uh, 2,000 feet. Right, and you wonder what they what they would be doing there, and then it was 5,000 feet, and then it was 10,000 feet. He's got a report of an aircraft um, at the end of Hartsfield Airport here, 17,000 feet. What you would be doing at 17,000 feet with an unmanned system, we don't know, but that is a definite crash hazard. So, if they catch that person, they're going to have some splaining. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so as far as for so let's go to practices, because I'm guessing you know obviously a live sporting event, a football game, there's issues just with the noise from the drones would be enough of a distraction to make people say this is not going to work. But for a practice, you know, we a closed practice outdoors, um, what are the challenges? Like there's, if there are people on the sidelines, is that, uh, as long as they're on the team, is it sort of like a film kind of thing where you could say if you're, as long as you're part of the team, you're allowed to 
be using drones for, for practice? The um, the movie industry has gotten has gotten the, the exemptions because they figured that the the FAA assumes that 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 movie set that they're filming on is controlled by the movie company. The people that are there are being paid by or in allowance of the movie company. So anything that happens, the movie company has control over that area. Uh, during practice, you guys could maybe claim that. So that still means you'd need a, a 333 exemption to legally fly there. But once all the spectators come in, those people are not willing participants of, of the game. And of, they're not employees of the school. So now it gets a little bit tougher to, to claim that. Um, at some point, the FAA may allow it, but unfortunately, the, you know, unmanned systems are, are mechanical objects and they fail. Um, they're subject to RF interference and, you know, cell towers and everything else can interfere with them and if they're not well isolated and, and protected from stray signals, they can just take off and go. And when they do, they're going to hit something and it's not going to be good. So that's, that's the danger. Right, right. So then how long do you think it would be before, I know it could be a long time, before you can say, the government will say, you know what, you can fly drones over a football stadium? And let's then tailgates and, and all kinds of stuff. Well, uh, it's, it's going to definitely be an individual thing. They're not going to just one day say, okay, we've decided you can do this, because that's going to open up every Yahoo that has a, a hobby aircraft to go start doing that. And, and you don't want that as, as somebody that controls that stadium. You want to maintain control of that. Uh, what the FAA is a big fan of, and I've heard this from them a number of times, is crawl, walk, run. And I don't even think it's that. I think it's crawl, walk, you know, trot, canter. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's small steps because they want you to prove that you can do something small and out of the way and innocuous safely. And once you can do that, then you can spread a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. So somebody that would, like, let's, let's just say a school, would have a team, and they wanted to do this, and they went through the process, got the exemption, got an aircraft, got a, a system that would do what they wanted to do, and just started doing practices, and did that successfully for a, a season, or maybe two, and then started a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and then petitioned the FAA for permission to fly over people. And if you've got a good safety record, and you've got really good training and good records and good flight time, they are tempted to, you know, they're, they're going to be more, much more willing to open up that ability. Each, each person. Mm -hmm. You can't say, well, that school over there is doing it, so therefore we should do it. Doesn't work that way. Everybody has to learn, go through that learning curve. So if you want to do that, the sooner you get started, the sooner, the sooner things are going to, you know, going to go your way. So obviously we have people here who are on the flip side of it as well. So you're running a venue and there's a tailgate. And there's the kid who says, you know what, I got a drone, and it's, it's the small one. He says, I'm just going to fly. I'm sure it happens probably every tailgate. Every time. So what should the schools do in order to get control of that situation, and, and how do they get their own personnel to be able to enforce regulations and tell people they have to pull things down, or how can you even find out who's, man, you know, who's controlled it? Um, boy, that's a ground enforcement issue. And most of the, you know, have some sort of law enforcement there. And I would put them in charge of that is getting them to get the, you know, get that stuff in order. Right. You don't want the FAA involved in it. If the FAA gets involved, it's gonna be long and protracted and expensive and that's just not a good, that's not a good use. And, and they don't wanna be involved, they really don't. Right. Um, they just want everybody to be safe. But if you get one person doing that and you don't stop them, the next game you're gonna have 10 and the next game you're gonna have 100, right? So pretty soon, you know, it's gonna be messy and then you will have involvement. And now, the, and, and the situation isn't like, um, the right to bear arms, right? Just because just you have, the, are people going to be able to say, oh, I have a right to fly this drone, because, well, or is that? Nope, not, not. Okay, so if someone says that, you just simply say you're wrong and. Incorrect, okay. correct, yeah, the, the airspace is controlled by the FAA. So if you don't have permission to fly, and it means written, and all the hoops I talked about, you're, you're not authorized. Um, to, to fly a, a hobby aircraft, you can go to a sanctioned hobby field, and and, and fly there, that's great. Do all that all you want. If you want to fly on your own property, fine, do that. But as soon as you get out in the public space, you know, flying down the street here, flying through downtown, not, not permitted. Right, right. For so, safety. So Tom, uh, w w have you guys done any tests and trials with drones? How, do, how does Turner, how do you look at, at drones? Because obviously it's a, it's a buzzy thing amongst the executives at a lot of the networks. Yeah, well, CNN's been, been test, doing a lot of tests with drones and, and um, you know, they did the, the uh, documentary on the bridge um, using drones and um, so 
there's a there's like exactly like you said a lot of trials and, and work done at a steps. I mean we're we're working on um, plans and you, know, you have to you have to apply for this. You can't just say okay we're going to do this and go out and do it. You have to get the approval to do it. So you know, we're working on a lot of those exemptions and we're waiting for the uh, you know, responses back. But it is this iterative process where you have to go and present. They have questions and you have to answer and go around several times through this process to get the exemption. Um, so it's, it really is a, a, an ongoing process. They, um, if you ask them, well, what do I need to do? They, they tell you, well, you tell us what you're doing. Um, we'll tell you and, if it's okay. And, and that's <laughs> what, so, so again, that's really why it's this iterative process. You, you, you present your plan, They'll ask questions, you provide the answers, and it, they'll go back and forth three times. So that's really the process of how that works. Um, it's best to have people who understand how to apply to the, how to write the exemptions to the uh, FAA because uh, this is a legal document, so you, you should have someone who understands that and knows the terminology and how they want it <coughs> formatted and their particular words and processes that they're looking for, especially because it does deal with uh, pilots, and so there are parameters around pilots that pilots understand, so it's There is a law firm here good. in Atlanta that specializes, it's just a few blocks from here, uh, right. that specializes in doing that. So, it's, so again, it's good to have that expertise. So, so those are the little things that we've been learning as we go through this process, and it is a process. So I want to introduce our other panelists um, from the vendor side. We have Ken with Canon, Bruce with Grass Valley, and Mike with Sony. Um, we're going to shift the conversation because um, 4K is obviously another big buzz topic. And I think a lot of people in this room may actually have an opportunity to distribute 4K content before a lot of the big broadcast networks were because they don't have to deal with set-top boxes and you can do the over-the-top, what have you. But uh, also, what I found at, at NEB this year is there are so many possibilities in imaging with respect to uh, what the sensors can do, and high dynamic range, and the availability for frame rates to go well beyond 60 frames, 120 frames. Um, and then obviously there's resolution with 4K, and then people are looking at 8K. I just got a call today, the, there's going to be a Yankee game, uh, a little demo of an 8K production in July. So when someone's out here who's done SD and HD, and, and they're kind of looking at the, looking their next generation of camera purchases, so let's say they want to purchase a camera next year or the year after, how should they approach this whole conundrum of resolution. I mean, should they just go 4K because, and just even if they're going to work primarily work in 1080p for the next couple of years? I mean, what's sort of the, the take? So, Ken, from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, one interesting thing that's happening with 4K production right now is um, we, it's not the same as when we went from standard definition to high definition. Everyone could see the advantages right away. There's a big break from the 4.3 to the 16.9 aspect ratio, color space changed. We see some of that with 4K, but when people ask, should I buy a 4K camera and should I get 4K production, it's not an easy question. 4K production is still something that's not for everyone. It can get difficult. But the ability to acquire in 4K is something that's advantageous. I mean, you're a sports community. I'm sure a lot of people out here remember shooting on film and then shooting on standard definition video and then going to high definition. Now you have the film archives, which are still reusable, and you have these HD archives, which are very good. And you have this break point in the middle that anything that was done in standard def is very hard to match in, especially if you're trying to reuse content. Like a player that may be playing in college is now suddenly a player for the NFL. People are looking for this content. You're losing some of the value of your pre-existing footage. So one of the interesting things about 4K is if you have the money and you can go out for the camera and you can spend the time doing the acquisition, you don't necessarily have to produce in 4K right now, but it gives you the ability to be future forward. You can always have those archives. You can save those files and go back to them. And one of the big advantages in 4K, too, is now we're going to these raw workflows, which we all know can get a little bit more complicated in how do you post-produce this, how do you do your raw color grading, but you can save those raw files. And those raw files are a lot smaller, so being able to go back that way, and maybe the standards change in a few years, or something, or color standards change, and you have to reproduce for whatever the next version of Blu-ray is going to be, or the next AK sets, or up -resing. you can go back to those files and still go forward. But at the same time, just because you have a 4K acquisition device doesn't mean you're forced to do it. So 
really what we're seeing as a camera manufacturer right now, and you'll see in a lot of our products, it's all about versatility. Can you shoot in 4K? Can you shoot in 2K? Maybe a lot of people might see now that 2K, 12-bit, higher color spaces is becoming important because the UHD standard that's out there also includes something called Rec 2020, which is a bigger color space. So it's not so much, is it just resolution people are seeing, or is it the whole sequence of things? Is it, it's a combination of resolution, color, um, frame rates, and it's more the tools that are out there and what is best for your current workflow. So I know that kind of talked around a lot of the questions, but it's things you need to consider when you're looking forward to a camera. Is this gonna give me not only what I need today, but will it also give me what I need going forward into the future? Bruce, can you share the Grass Valley? I mean, you guys had an interesting licensing model that kind of came out at the show. Um, and, so, and is that for like the more of the higher end cameras, or do you think that that is the kind of service that would also go toward, you know, become standard across? We uh, have a the licensing model across all of our camera portfolio. We see 4K and high frame rate as two different tools that can be used in the production uh, process. Um, customers may not be able to afford it out of the gate, but they may be looking to be future protected for it. The, the licensing model says that you can start at uh, a, a lower resolution, 1080i, 1080p, uh, upgrade to 4K, upgrade to 6X, um, upgrade to switchable between the two, um, as short as a seven-day license or a permanent license. So our, our methodology has been to try and be as flexible as possible and, and match to the business models that are out there for the customers and say if you want to purchase um, 1080 uh, today, you want to purchase 4K today, those are available. If you want to purchase 1080 today and upgrade to 4K or upgrade to high frame rate, those are available too. Gotcha. Mike, you want to share the Sony perspective on some of the introductions? Yeah, so, there? Um, so first of all, Rob was supposed to be here, but we needed to kind of hit the bald guy quota for the panels, yes, exactly. and so <laughs> just kicked aside, and I kind of had to fit in. But, um, as a, as a user of the, the content in the field and, and a person that acquires in the field, um, I think that the real value to everybody in this room of, of what 4K adds is uh, the concept of even if, as was mentioned by Ken earlier, if you're, if you're not using it for now, um, shooting it for forward thinking is helpful, but at the very least, having a camera that actually is 4K or more um, resolution gives you the ability to oversample, to, to yield basically better looking HD content. Um, and something that happened recently, my fiance, who has great eyes, I have to say, but they don't work very well, which is great for me, because I mean, right? But um, I have a 4K set at home, and she's not really big on watching stuff, but she, her eyes don't really work that well. Um, but she's like, wow, this is the first time that I can actually see, which I believe HD to look like, but she's actually watching a 4K set. Now it looks great to me, but the fact of the matter is, I'm like, that's a really interesting point. 4K in a way can be like HD for people with bad eyesight, perhaps. Um, and really, that's, that's one of the things that it really provides. It's, it's great resolution. Um, and the nice thing is the new TVs, and by the way, if anybody in this room is looking at buying a TV set anytime soon, it would be entirely foolhardy to buy a non-4K set. I can just say that. Because of the reasons for all these TVs have the ability to sample inside, so they upconvert the quality uh, to 4K, or upscale, as they call it, which actually in engineering terms is not a good thing, but in marketing terms, that's what they call it. Um, but the high dynamic range that is provided and the color imagery is through the roof. So those are all added benefits that everybody in this room should really consider taking advantage of right out of the gate. Now relative to cameras, um, you know, the, the idea that 4K has to be raw is not necessarily true. Um, 4K cameras can be raw. Um, they can also be encoded video. Um, and the question becomes how manageable do you want these file sizes to be? Can you natively edit them? Uh, all those things need to be considered. And all of us as camera manufacturers have a solution that can meet some sort of need. So you can't make a bad decision but you can certainly make the wrong decision. And the wrong decision, quite frankly, would be to shoot something that is not gonna protect your asset going forward. So um, finding a solution that makes the most sense is really key, and we mentioned it here, but shooting stuff that you can protect and work with and, and maybe shoot from a 4K frame and resize and post or do some sort of cropping on the fly from that larger frame really helps uh, add to your tools. But then you also have the built-in benefits of high frame rate and high definition, which can really help you tell your story because everybody knows in here the big, the big way, or at least should know, big way to get more eyes on your program and bring in more revenue is through video. Uh, I know that Bagby mentioned that last year in this room, I believe, um, but it's true. So that's our point. Now how about as far as the different form factors? Because I think what I find fascinating is um, what was an all you know, ENG camera and the hard cameras, now you look at the SLRs, 
and the alpha. Can you talk about that camera and also the SLRs? And where, they, where do you guys see those kind of fitting into the bigger production scheme? You want me to start and yeah. then we'll, we'll go yeah. back, kind of like fantasy draft? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, when you have these large format sensors, the real value that everybody's trying to do is storytelling. You're trying to command the audience's attention. One of the ways to do that is through a larger format sensor, whether it be APS-C size or Super 35 or full frame like the DSLRs have. Um, we at Sony happen to have a, a camera that's quite popular called the A7S. Just out of curiosity, how many people have you heard of the A7S? Okay, homework assignment. Everybody needs to Google <laughs> Sony A7S because it's a camera that, um, for those of you that are kind of looking for something that's economical but really kind of provides through the roof capability, this camera is optimized for low light video recording but in a full frame sensor. It's only a 12 megapixel still sensor, um, but it can operate with an ISO between 50 and 409,000. And what that basically means is you can effectively over uh, expose in the dark. So think about that in a $2,500 camera that you can do, you know, helmets with one flashlight and do some really high quality stuff in an affordable camera that you can also shoot great stills, get some reg regular speed video, but also high speed stuff as well. And um, that's just one of the tools that's provided. But the, the, the mixture of full size cameras or handheld 35s in conjunction with DSLRs can really, you know, as B cameras or even A cameras, um, for instance, we did a, an effort with the Anaheim Ducks earlier this year where Timu Solani, who had retired last year, they did a tribute for him. They wound up shooting this tribute with their front office that said, this is important as the Stanley Cup for us, so we need to make sure we do this right. They wound up shooting it on two of Sony F55s, which is a, sh a camera that's used to shoot the Blacklist and other high-end shows. But they also use B cameras with this A7S. So it's a $2,500 camera intercutting with a $30,000 uh, 4K cinema camera, and they're doable. So. It's about doing your homework and understanding the tool sets are out there. And, and every, ven every vendor at this table has some really nice tool that you guys could leverage. It, you know, that's why we're all here. So do the homework. We got the stuff here. Um, but there's a lot that can be done. It doesn't have to be you know, $100,000 cameras to do good stuff. The key, though, is that they're all 4K samples or higher. And by the way, one thing about the 4K versus 8K, you all should probably understand that there is a limited return once you get up to certain resolutions. The human eye can only resolve a certain amount of resolution. And once you get above 3K in the color imagery of the typical eyesight for what a human resolve of uh, human resolution could resolve, 3K in a resolution of color and about 5K of resolution in actual uh, spatial resolution. So as much as 8K and 6K and all this stuff is great, 8K TV sets, we probably will come out with them eventually, but I don't know if it necessarily makes sense because the human eye can't resolve that anymore. Right? Um, I made a joke a couple weeks ago at CSVA. It's kind of like you know, taking up too much vitamin C at some point. Um, you, know, you just get no benefit of it after a point. You just don't have diarrhea from watching too much resolution. Um, so it's just something to understand. The real reality of where you would need 5K or 6K would be for oversampling. If you're using plates and you want to zoom in and stuff like that. So there's a purpose for those things. But at some point, the, eye, the human eye just kind of shuts down. There's nothing else to see. And that camera also is compatible with both Can Canon and Nikon lenses, isn't it, with the adapter? It is, it is. So we can take the adva full advantage of the, what is it, 10 billion lenses that Canon has <laughs> on the, the market now? It's, it's an impressive number, but uh, yeah. And Ken, from your perspective, obviously Canon and the digital still businesses. Yeah, I think from Canon's perspective, we have a very interesting perspective on this because we didn't have high-end cinema cameras till about three years ago. So we came into this market from DSLRs. I mean, Set of curiosity, how many people out there are still shooting DSLR footage of some sort? So it's, it's quite a few. So one of the interesting things were when we released the 5D Mark II, which was the first camera that had video for us, it was designed for a lot of um, web content. People wanted content for secondary screens, secondary content, and still photographers that couldn't take out two cameras. But the quality of those, high, uh, those big sensors and the low light capabilities made it not only really pleasing to people who are shooting cinematically or for different types of uh, narrative acquisition, but it also gave different types of looks and things that weren't easily accessible to most people. A lot of people might have been going out and even shooting two third inch cameras, which had somewhat of control of depth of field and stuff like that, but you're talking about $30,000 cameras and the rest of the world that was using um, handhelds or something else with very small chips, big depth of field, very hard to get that creative control. So one thing that we saw with DSLRs was suddenly now everyone's adopting this because now they have to do the ability to do what people who are shooting narrative had to do. They can control their focus. They can control what you're looking at. And that gave another storytelling tool. And 
how you tell the story is really how you get people to pay attention to content. So this exploded for us, and we spent a lot of time looking at DSLRs and where it was evolving, and what were the limitations. Um, because they're still cameras, they still have to be still cameras first, and video is a secondary market for them. And what can we do as a manufacturer to kind of cater to that community? So we took a very different approach when we released our cinema lineup, which was we tried to take what people liked out of that DSLR, the ability to bring these lower cost cameras into the field and get different types of content that most people couldn't do in the past without basically going out and renting very expensive camera packages. So this has kind of grown and now you'll see like there's an evolution. It's not just with us and though you know we have quite a few different cameras that have come out of this. We started out with a, kind of a medium um, HD acquisition device that we came out with a 4K acquisition device using external recorders. Now we have uh, smaller cameras in the lineup like our C100 that you know, for $7,000 you can walk out there and you can shoot a motion picture if you want to. It still comes down to what your story is, though, how good is your content. So DSLRs still have their place. Um, one thing, we still see the large sensor, the, what we call full frame DSLR um, sensors for stills. They're actually bigger than the Super 35. So there's still a lot of appeal to people using things like the 5D and the very big sensors because this is closer to what people were getting out of um, 70 millimeter film. So there's actually a different look to those cameras than even a super 35 millimeter uh, cinema camera. So there's still a lot of interplay between those cameras. There's people that grew up um, out there learning to shoot on these cameras and are still very comfortable with them. So it's still kind of all across the board. We see a lot of people moving from DSLRs into traditional cinema cameras and we still see people that are using traditional DSLRs to shoot films. So it's still growing and I don't see that market declining anytime soon. So Tom, from the practical 4K perspective, I mean, 4K is being used in a lot of your productions now, um, and as far as for the, for the zoom and the, the sort of functionality, but also well, stitching. Actually, uh, we, well, huh? yeah. we don't use a lot of 4K. Um, well, you know, we heard the acquisition end, and gonna, I'll go all the way to the other end and the delivery side of things, because that's, uh, for many of us, once you produce the content, you know, where does it go, what do you do with it? So. I would equate the uh, delivery side of, of uh, 4K to where HD was in the mid 90s, where it's still a science experiment. So I think um, you know ev everyone sort of understands now that the early 4K uh, distribution will be over the top, um, but in the current uh, encoding, in the current encoding that's out there. Uh, you can deliver that stream at maybe 25 megabits or in around that range. And if you uh, measure what, uh, what the most um, providers, whether you get your uh, internet from Comcast or, or Verizon or from you know, some other uh, distributor, uh, typically your connection is not able to sustain that bit rate. So even if uh, we, you could create the content, get it there, you really can't deliver it consistently to the consumer. So we're still very early in that. Um, so I w had a conversation uh, the other night uh, with uh, uh, someone about this and looking at the numbers of the um, growth of the demand if you double the numbers every year, we're still talking about probably four or five years to, we, to where we get to the tipping point of where this technology will be ready. So it's still, a f in, technology year, in technology years, it's still a ways off. Mm -hmm. And we're still working on the workflows and the technology's getting better, but it's not quite there where it'll be available for the masses. Um, now how about the 4K? So Stitch, because I know that's obviously been bouncing around for a while. Yeah, so that's really where we've been putting a lot more effort into um, looking at how can 4K uh, provide us a, a tool, a platform that we can improve many of the workflows that we have. Um, one of the things that we do is um, we uh, provide uh, video um, coverage for um, some sm smaller, what we call the non-revenue sports for college. And um, you know, we were obligated to capture that. Um, so we're thinking of how could we improve that workflow. 
so that uh, we can still create a compelling pro, you know, compelling uh, coverage, but reduce the number of people that are there, reduce the equipment, um, put the uh, uh, put the effort into technology and not people. So that's what we started looking at. What if we stitch two 4K cameras together and we're able to cut out multiple windows from that? Now I could actually have HD quality coverage off of two cameras and off of one system. So yes, it would, cr it would need a, a higher capital investment, but if I'm now covering 400 events on a per event basis, that actually gets down to pretty small numbers. So, it, that's where we started looking really at the, you know, 4K as a platform that could use to support um, production. Um, and if 8K comes around, we'll look at 8K and doing that. But really, that's where we started looking at from the low end. How could we use that technology as a platform to improve the quality of the events that we're doing, uh, improve the cost efficiency events that we're doing, so that's where, at least from my side, where we've been looking at 4K. Um, as far as uh, capturing on all of our high-level productions, um, especially feature documentary, they're all shot 4K. They're produced in HD, but we shoot all the content in 4K and we archive the content in 4K. So yes, it's the cost differential now is basically the cost of a couple of storage cards. So we shoot it, two, three hundred dollars a card, put that on the shelf. So now we've got high resolution. So when the day comes, if we ever need it, that content's available. But the production is still pretty much done in HD, deliveries all in HD. So that's probably the next couple of years where that model's still going to be very valid until the pipeline opens up where we can deliver a full sustained 25 megabits to the consumer. At that point, you'll start seeing widespread uh, 4K distribution. Mm -hmm. So Bruce, uh, if you go back to f you know five, six years ago, seven years ago when we had our first summits here, and even when SVG first started, you know HD transition was just almost really kind of, it wasn't until about 2013 or so that it really kind of became the norm. I mean, you know, at that point it was, the discussion was HD is too expensive, I can't afford to do it. Now, everybody in this room probably has an HD capable recording device in their pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so how, how quickly do you see four? So, so I think what happens is you instinctively think, well, HD, 4K is going to be a, suffer those same things. But do you, see, do you think the cost of the 4K cameras will, they're not as astronomical, you know, as, as the early HDs of HD cameras. So do you think that the 4K will become much more, uh, gain traction more quickly because of the price points and the things like your licensing systems? So that's not. Price isn't, isn't the gating factor, it's things like bandwidth and... <laughs> I, um, there's realistically not much difference between high frame rate and 4K, both of them being different tools. And um, those tools are a little more expensive, but um, probably today in the realm of difference between some of the, the mid-level adoption of HD, not the early adoption of HD. In other words, like, you know, 30% higher or something like that. Um, but a lot of the equipment is already prepared for 4K. Um, production switchers uh, support 4K. Granted, it takes four times as many inputs. Um, it takes four times as much MixFX bus technology to do it. Um, uh, the cameras are, are uh, in our case, it's the same sensor we're using for 4K and HD and 6X. So, so the camera technology um, has some differences. You need a, a higher bandwidth transmission path. In other words, the back end of the camera and the base station have to support higher bandwidth, but um, all of the control is the same. So it's not a huge increase to go to that. Um, storage is obviously four times to eight times greater, depending upon if you're in 1080i or moving to 4K. So there, there's some differentials there. Um, but I see that, uh, I don't see it as a, a, a huge difference. And again, what we've tried to do with the licensing model is preserve the HD cost of entry, um, but give the opportunity to uh, have a future, um, you know, avoid the risk of the future. 
uh, when you want to upgrade to 4K or high frame rate or switchable between the two, make that just a software license. Okay. Any questions before we wrap up? Okay, great. So uh, I just want to remind you that Grass Valley, Canon, and Sony are all out here, and we're going to take a break. So please go check out their 4K wares outside. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for taking part. Thank you.